this next section, I'd like to talk a little bit about periodic inspections. In order to do these periodic inspections, we'll be looking at the Lycoming Operator's Manual. Now, this Operator's Manual uh, is an important one for you to have for several reasons. One, for the safety of being sure that you inspect everything that Lycoming thought needed to be inspected. A second reason is because of the liability of not having this one and not making the proper logbook entries. I've been a part over the past 10 years of three NTSB investigations where an airplane crashed. Fortunately, uh, nobody was hurt in any of them, but there was serious damage done to the airplane. And in each of those, uh, there were violations that were found because the operator's manual had not been followed and the periodic inspections, if they had been done, were not recorded. And in at least one case, they were not being done. So it's very, very important that you, uh, um, that you follow this operator's manual as far as the periodic inspections are concerned. Let's go back to page 302. And uh, I'm going to hit through some of these that, uh, I'm not going to read the entire section, but there are a few that are important that, um, that I would like to just touch on. Uh, at, the, at the very top of the page, it talks about the daily pre-flight inspection, and it gives several items there for daily pre-flight inspections. Under point number six, it says remove, clean, and replace oil strainers in new or newly overhauled engines after the first five hours of operations with model R680D and R680E series engines, turn Cuno oil filter handle one full turn after each 10 hour period of engine operation. Now you remember that we looked at that a little bit ago on the engine, turning that, uh, that Cuno oil fil filter handle. They call out turning it one full turn after every 10 hours of operation. Whenever you turn that handle, the plates scrape against one another and scrape whatever carbon and gasket fuzz and whatever other material into the bottom of that chamber. So it's important to do that at least once every 10 hours or that thing will build up so much crud in between the plates that it will lock up and you'll have to uh, disassemble it in order to make it work. And also remove, clean, and replace the oil strainers in new or newly overhauled engines after the first five hours. So they're giving it five hours then change the oil. The next thing down there is the 25 hour inspections. And under the 25-hour inspection, you'll see on page 303, it says under 11, check mounting bolts, nuts, and screws. Now, this is something that we find that a lot of people are not doing. They're, they're not going over their engine every 25 hours looking for loose things. And as a result, you have oil leaks and sometimes worse. One of the things that you should always be looking for on a Lycoming engine are broken cylinder base studs. We'll talk about that in the under the 50 hour inspection, but every 25 hours you should be looking for that constantly, looking at your cylinder bases for the possibility of, uh, of broken cylinder base studs. Uh, under 13, check the propeller hub nut. The propeller hub nut retaining hub retaining nut must be tight. Any looseness present may not only cause galling of the rear cone, but vibration loads accompanying such looseness may also damage the crankshaft and other parts of the engine. If that propeller is loose, it will it will break the crankshaft. It will also eat up the main bearings. Uh, we've seen that where if uh, if the propeller was not properly torqued, uh, one engine lasted uh, about 35 hours before the crankshaft developed a spiral crack that went around and around the crankshaft and it all had to do with the nut not being tight. 50 hour inspection at the bottom of 303. This inspection which includes both daily and 25 hour inspection outlined in detail above is to be a complete engine check after each 50 hours of average operation. Model R680D, Model R680E, and R530 series engines require this inspection after the first 50 hours of operation when the engine is new or newly overhauled thereafter. These engines require the following inspection after each 100 hours of average operation. So what that's saying is if you have a 225 Lycoming, then you have to do these inspections every 
50 hours. If you have a, a 300 horse, you can do them the first 50 hours after an overhaul and then every 100 hours thereafter. All right, down uh, under the 50 hour inspection, under, uh, number four, check valve operating mechanism. Remove the rocker covers and the front spark plugs, clean out the rocker boxes, coming on down, and, and let's, uh, let's just go over and look at the engine and we'll go through adjusting the valves on, on one cylinder and I think that that will, uh, that will be a better demonstration than going through this verbally. In order to adjust the valves on our engine, we'll first need to make sure that the cylinder that we're going to adjust the valves on it, the piston is at top dead center. So I've set the, the piston at top dead center on the compression stroke for number one just to demonstrate uh, we'll adjust one valve here. And um, so this, this is set at, at top dead center number one and that means that the, both of the, of the cam uh, rollers are between lobes on the cam. So they're on the they're on the track out in the ramp, not on the on the lobe. And I have a 15 thousandths feeler gauge here. You can also use a dial indicator if you would like. But uh, let's let's come in close on this, and you'll be able to see what I'm doing as I do it. One of the things that you'll notice about the Lycoming engine, if you depress the rocker arm, you'll see that there's actually a spring action there. That's a spring that's in the tappet. Some people mistakenly think that they have hydraulic tappets. They do not have hydraulic tappets. However, there is a spring in the tappet that keeps the roller always in contact with the cam so that as the, as the, the cam comes around and engages the, the roller and begins on the ramp to depress the valve, it isn't slapping it. The, the roller is always in contact with the cam because of that uh, that spring action there, so this is the this is the valve lash that you're looking at here, and there's way too much of it right now. I have uh, loosened the lock nut here, so you can see the that the um, the lock bolt is uh, is loose, and that means that we can turn the adjuster screw freely and we can adjust the valve. So we've got our 15 thousandths feeler gauge. We put it under the roller, between the roller and the valve tip. And now we're going to tighten this down until we can just feel the roller stop. We don't want to go too far. If we go too far, we'll take too much lash out of it but we just want to, to take enough out so that you can feel the resistance of the feeler gauge as you, as you push it. Now, a mistake that some people have made is to feel like that what they have to do, and I'll back this off, way off, so that you'll see what I'm demonstrating here. See, we still have, we still have that spring. It's possible to back this off until we can no longer feel the spring. And we have seen, see that, that the spring is no longer engaged. We have seen people now adjust their valves at this point so that they're 15 thousandths above spring engagement. That's about 15 thousandths above the point where the spring engages but you actually have about another 125 thousandths of lash there in the spring. If you do that, the engine will actually run pretty good, but you'll, it'll clatter horribly. It really makes a lot of noise. And so uh, your valves will all be opening late. You don't want to do that. You want to adjust it down into the spring so it's the last 15 thousandths before it locks up solid. So that's what we're looking for is the last 15 thousandths. And that's it right about there. Now after, we, after we're finished with that, you want to be sure and relock this lock bolt. If you don't relock the lock bolt, 
in about an hour the adjuster will back itself completely out of there and um, the cylinder will go cold it'll stop firing so once you've tightened that that lock bolt go back and double check the adjusting screw to be sure that you can't move the adjuster screw sometimes the bolt will feel tight when it's not actually and you can still turn the adjuster screw so be sure that the uh, that the adjuster screw is tight and the bolt are tight the lash is still at 15 thousandths in the spring and that's all there is to adjusting this valve so at this point we could adjust both of the intake valves then we would move the uh, crankshaft to the next cylinder and the way that I usually do it is to move from cylinder one to cylinder three which is the next in the firing order then to cylinder five then seven then nine two four six eight and then you're you're back at uh, at number one again I have here a, um, a Lycoming cam. This particular one is a 300 horse cam. You can tell because it has this ring gear that is bolted to the front of it. This is to drive the, uh, the prop governor. The uh, 225 cam does not have the, uh, the prop governor, so it doesn't have the gear. But there are several things that you can notice about this thing. It's got a, a set of teeth on the inside where it is driven uh, on the engine by the uh, cam drive gear. It has two tracks on it. It has uh, an intake track and an exhaust track. So one track opens the intake valves, the other track opens the exhaust valves. And you'll notice if you count the lobes, we have one, two, three, four lobes on each track. All right, now what that means to us practically is uh, if we go back to our, our discussion about valve adjustments, when we run through that first two revolutions of the crankshaft where we were following the firing order, we adjust one, three, five, seven, nine, two, four, six, eight. So we've done that. That took two revolutions of the crankshaft. Um, what we've done is we have only done one quarter of the work here because we have four lobes. We have four lobes that are opening these things. This is turning at one-eighth crankshaft speed. So in order for us to adjust the valves, the first thing that we have to do is go through that um, that cycle, that first two revolutions where we adjust the valves. Then everything else that we're doing, we're just checking the valves to the other lobes on the cam. And we're verifying that all the lobes are the same. So on the, on the uh, revolution one and two, we adjust them all to 15 thousandths. On revolutions three and four, we're just checking to make sure that nothing is tighter than 15 thousandths. Uh, we don't want any valves that are tight. A valve that's tight will, uh, will be open or could be open during the combustion cycle and would burn the valve and seat. So we just want to be sure that nothing is tighter than 15 thousandths. It's a little bit loose, that's okay. Uh, but, uh, but we want to make sure on, three, on revolutions three and four that nothing is tight. Then re revolutions five and six, we're checking checking to verify that nothing is tighter than 15 thousandths. Revolutions 7 and 8, the same thing. Now, if we find one on, let's say, on revolutions uh, uh, 5 and 6 that is uh, a little bit tight, then we loosen it back to 15 thousandths. Now, what that means is when we come around to revolution 1 and 2 again, it's going to be a little bit loose because that was where we adjusted them. That's okay. A little bit loose is okay. A little bit tight, we don't want to see that. Coming back to point five, we have check and lubricate the magneto. Check magneto for security of mounting and for possible leakage of oil around the mounting flange. And then it talks about checking the magneto points. Um, that's something that needs to happen every 50 hours or with an, uh, with an E3 um, every 50 hours or 50 hours for the first and then every 100 thereafter. The magneto needs to be inspected. Those points are, are wearing. And, uh, and you've got two sets of them, and so uh, those things need to be inspected. Okay, next we're going to demonstrate uh, timing the magneto to the engine. 
But before we do that, we have to find 34 or yeah, 30 degrees before top dead center. And in order to find 30 degrees before top dead center, we have to find out where top dead center is. And uh, that's a little bit tricky with these engines. Uh, many people use the uh, time right indicator, and it has a, a special arm and a special card for the Lycoming engine. And that uh, will get you close. But it, it isn't as accurate as a method that I'm going to, uh, to show you in a minute. Uh, what I'm going to show you in a minute is a, um, a video clip that I shot sometime earlier with the Jacobs engine. And uh, what's kind of neat about this one is that I'm using our Jacobs cutaway engine. And our cutaway allows you to see as we're turning the crankshaft where the piston is and what's actually happening inside the engine. The principles are all the same whichever radial engine that we're talking about. And so, um, so I'm going to use that to show you how to find top dead center. Now we do use the time right, but we only use the time right for, uh, for initially finding top dead center, and we use it in conjunction with a propeller protractor. Um, this, uh, this is a much more accurate system. Now the reason that it's, uh, that it's difficult to do it just with the time right is that if you can envision the, the piston moving up towards top dead center and the crankshaft is turning at the same time, there comes a point as the piston reaches top dead center where everything is going to reverse direction. And as it does, there's play everywhere. There's play in the master rod bearing, there's play in the piston pin bushing, there's play in all the gear train, and so as we're moving towards top dead center, it, it's being pushed, but then there comes a point where the crankshaft continues to move, but the piston isn't doing anything. It's just sitting there because all the play is being taken out of all the gear train, and then the piston begins to move again. And so near top dead center, there are a few degrees where the piston really isn't doing anything. It's all the play is being taken out of the system. All right, so that's why the the uh, the time right is is a little bit inaccurate at that uh, at that point because it doesn't really recognize where in the travel it is. Did did the piston stop? Okay, the piston stopped, and the the uh, um, the indicator on the time right has said nothing's moving anymore, but it isn't moving for several degrees. And so it doesn't know if if top dead center is here, 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 here. It's not really sure because the piston just isn't moving anymore. It's it's reversing direction and all the all the um, play is being taken out of the gear train and all the clearances and the bearings and all that kind of stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the time right in conjunction with a protractor and I'm going to show you how you can use those together to uh, to get very accurate. Now you don't have to put, you don't have to take your propeller off and use a protractor. There is also this universal uh, true timing indicator, which is one of the commercial uh, versions that's available that you can clip on over your propeller. We actually have on our website the plans for making both a, uh, an indicator like this and making the uh, protractor, so uh, you might want to go there and, and look at that. But let's, let's look at this, uh, at this video and that will, uh, I think, make this clearer. All right, we've got this roughly set at zero now. What I've done is just using the time right, I've watched the time right arm until it, I estimate that that's about top dead center. So I loosened the set screw on the back of the, um, of the protractor and I zeroed it with the pointer. So it's, it's roughly top dead center now. So what we'll do now is we will we'll back this thing up and using, you'll see that I've put a red mark on, um, on the time right. Now you don't have to put a red mark on yours if you don't want to. Just use a piece of tape, but we're not going to use the card that usually slips in there. We're, we just want a reference mark on here. And that's what I've done is I've, I've made a reference mark. So we're going, to move, we're going to move the crankshaft, and we're moving it away from top dead center, and then we're going to bring it back down again until the arm the top of the arm is at the top of my red mark. Now we're going to read the, uh, the protractor. We read the protractor. The protractor says 34 degrees. All right? So we know that it, on this side of top dead center, it reads 34 degrees. 
Now let's go to the other side. You see we're coming back towards top dead center, zero someplace in there. Okay, we go back, and now we're going to bring it back. We're bringing it back down again so that it, the top of the arm matches the top of the red line. Okay, and now we read it. We've got 29 degrees. Okay, so there's a, there's a difference. On one side we had 34, on the other side we have 29. That's a five degree difference. Now what we know now is we just took all the, the play out of all the gear train and everything, there's a five degree difference. So the place where zero is is actually two and a half degrees inside of that five degree bracket. So we can either take two and a half degrees away from 34 degrees and come up with 31 and a half degrees, or we can add two and a half degrees to 29 and still come up with 31 and a half degrees. But what that means is that our pointer, rather than pointing at 29 or 34, needs to point at 31 and a half. So we'll loosen the set screw and we'll move it very slightly to 31 and a half degrees. All right, now we can go back to the other side and check it. Okay, we go past and we bring it back down again so that it's just at the top of the line and we check it and we're at 31 and a half degrees. So what, what we've done now is taken all the backlash out of the system <clears throat> so that we know that when we bring it down here and we set it at zero, it truly is at zero. Probably better than half a degree. But we've taken all the backlash out of the system doing this and we verified that that now our protractor is zeroed. And once our protractor is zeroed, we're finished with the time right. It was just a tool to help us find top dead center. So we can take it out now. And it's easier for me to take mine out than it is for you to take yours out because you have to thread yours out and mine is in a cutaway cylinder. I have here a DFN Magneto of the style that uh, is used on all of the, the later R680 engines, both the uh, 225s and the 300s. And uh, I have um, I've taken all the screws out of the coil covers and out of the top uh, contact cover so that you can see what this thing looks like when we, re when we remove those covers. It's a little more obvious now that we actually have two magnetos built into the same housing. Uh, this is the, um, the left hand side and this is the right hand side. So it, it's a completely separate electrical system on both sides. So we have, uh, we have coil and condenser for the left side, have coil and condenser for the right side. And then in the, um, in the top of it, we have the contact points. And here we have the, uh, the left side contact points and the right side contact points. These things operate completely independently of each other. The only thing that they have in common is the shaft. Um, I'll just mention this to you. Um, one thing that you, you don't want to do is, is hold the magneto like this and spin the shaft. Uh, if you do, you will get a high voltage um, surprise from this thing. <laughs> it, will, uh, it will shock you thoroughly. Uh, I, um, I tell you this because I read about this in a book somewhere. No. Uh, I have I have firsthand experience with this, and uh, on the the fourth or fifth time, I said, you know what, this this really isn't a good idea. So uh, so don't spin the shaft while you're holding the coils; uh, it will bite you. Well, let's take this thing over to the um, to the bench, and we'll we'll set it up, and we'll look at how these points are adjusted, how the internal timing is done on this magneto. Okay, here's our DFN uh, set up on the bench. I'd like to point out a few things to you uh, before we start working on it. You'll see the left-hand points here, the right-hand points here. Um, both of these points are mounted to a point plate. And both of these point plates you'll see have screws that are adjustable. So the point plates uh, can be moved. It also has some scribed marks on it. And I've highlighted these with a magic marker to make them a little easier to see. But you'll see there are scribed marks there both on this outer rim of the housing and on the little 
uh, point plate. So scribed mark on the outer rim and scribed mark on the point plate. Now what you'll notice is that on the on the left hand side the scribed mark on the uh, point plate is lined up with the scribed mark on the outer rim. On the right points it's staggered. There's your four and a half degrees of spark stagger right there. They machined a flat on the cam can see that uh, that this is a machined flat here on the cam and they have a direction of rotation arrow so the cam is designed to be running counterclockwise now if the if the cam is running counterclockwise we can uh, make the same thing happen by turning the uh, the housing clockwise so if we turn the housing clockwise it's the same as turning uh, the shaft counterclockwise now that we lay the the uh, straight edge in that machine slot on the cam and you'll see what I was saying here there's the um, the mark on the on the left points and on the housing there's the the mark on the housing so those that's all lined up for the left points and if we rotate the housing a little bit there's the mark for the um, for the right points now what I've done is hooked up a timing light to this. Uh, these are the contacts where the uh, terminal comes in and hits the um, the P-lead terminals come in. And uh, so this is a good place to grab it. What you may want to do is get a couple of the P-lead terminals, put a piece of wire uh, in them, install a piece of wire so that you can just stick that in. You don't have to worry about taking your, uh, your coil covers off. You can just stick your P-lead terminals in there and it makes a good test setup. And then I've got the, the light set up here. I've got the, um, it's grounded to the housing here, uh, hooked up to the left, hooked up to the right. It's, it's all set to go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this thing on and we're going to see how close the points are lining up to their, their marks on the housing. Now, unlike some other setups, this has no specific point gap. We're just looking to, to set the points up so that they open at the correct time. So let's put the, uh, the straight edge here. We'll turn the light on. We'll back it up a little bit. And, and always remember that we're trying to get the lights to come on. That means the points are just opening. We don't want the lights to be going out. So, okay, the point just opened there. It looks to me like we're a degree or two early on the, um, on the 34 right side. And we keep turning around here. Uh, we're probably two degrees early on the, um, on the left side. Okay, so we'll turn that off for a second and we'll go to the point adjustment screws. We have adjustment screws so we can loosen these screws on the the right point and you'll notice that, that we have this adjuster which is actually a little eccentric and so we can move the entire point assembly with that little cam eccentric there. So that's how we'll adjust them. We'll, we'll, find, we'll make it so that, um, so that these points are opening just as it hits the 34 or the four and a half degree stagger mark, which is at 34 on the engine. And then we'll adjust these so that they are hitting at 30. So let's put the straight edge back up there again. Turn it back on. And we'll put it right at 34. Okay, and we'll just get the light to come on. Now we're going to lock them down. And now we want to double check. Yep, coming coming open right at 34 degrees. Okay, now we'll, now you can see we're opening considerably early on the left side, so we'll adjust those, loosen the, the screws.
bring it around to to its marks. Okay, I'll tighten these down. And we'll double check everything. So we'll back it off here. So we're probably, oh, four or five degrees advanced there, coming around. Okay, the right one just opened. The left one just opened. So that, that's the adjustment on the, uh, on the internal timing on the magneto. Okay, we're ready to install the magneto on the accessory case now. We've got the crankshaft set at 30 degrees before top dead center. And this is the location where the magneto will go. This is the magneto adapter which adapts the magneto down to the accessory case. One of the things you'll notice about our magneto is that it has a very coarse spline on the drive end of it. There are only six teeth on that spline. Now what that means is it, each one of those will account for 60 degrees of motion. And the trouble is that we've only got about 15 degrees here of slot, of adjustment slot. So if we've got 60 degree teeth and 15 degrees of adjustment, you can see that we could run into a problem here where we would try to install the magneto and, and we wouldn't be able to find a place where it would go in and we would have uh, the studs in, the, in our adjustment slots. Not to worry, like homing thinks of everything. We can take the adapter and lift it up and you'll notice that it has many teeth on the other end. So what we can do, if, if we find that, uh, that the particular location where we are trying to go in won't work, we can move the teeth just a little bit, find a, another spot where we can drop it in, another tooth, and then we'll time our magneto in that location. And we have our, our straight edge again. And what we'll do is we'll lay our straight edge across the, uh, the slots and align our marks. That's pretty close. The, the cam doesn't really try to rotate, doesn't really try to go anywhere. And so um, we'll drop this thing down in there. See if we can find a place where it will align and drop in. Okay, so it dropped in right there. We'll get the uh, straight edge back up here again and check our marks. Need to move it just a little bit. And there it's aligned. So, you know, if, um, if you haven't uh, used the, um, the timing light prior to this, then this is a good time to get the, the timing light in the act because you can, uh, you can clip the timing light on and, and rather than use the straight edge, you can use the timing light. Either way is acceptable. We've already verified the, um, the timing marks with the straight edge and the timing light, so I'm leaving the timing light out and just using the, uh, the marks at this point. We would then put the washers, the nuts on here, and, um, and torque these nuts down. The magneto is, uh, is now timed to the engine. Periodically, people ask us why the spark is staggered on the magneto. Why do we have the right side of the magneto firing at 34 degrees before top dead center and the left side uh, firing at 30 degrees? I'll tell you why. Uh, Lycoming looked at the design of their cylinder and they said, gee, you know, this cylinder has got a lot of cooling air coming at the front side of the cylinder. On the back side, doesn't have much cooling air at all. And so they experimented a little bit and what they found was that if they 
timed both of them at the same time. So let's say 30 degrees before top dead center, and they had the both sides of the magneto firing at exactly the same time. The hot rear spark plug was able to start the fire there, and that fire, because it was hotter back there, would move towards the center of the piston faster than that of the front, which was cooler and was moving slower as the, as the flame um, you know, got started by that front spark plug. And so they experimented, and what they found was that if they staggered the spark, so they started the spark, they start the fire four degrees before on the front side before the rear side, then they found that the flame front would reach the center of the piston at the same time. So there would be uh, an even combustion event. So that was why they, uh, why they staggered the spark. This is the um, right side of our accessory case, and I'd like to point out something here on the right distributor. If you'll notice, we've got the distributor finger, which we looked at earlier, Behind the distributor cap, which the distributor cap would go over the top here, we have this phenolic plate. And there is a specific phenolic plate for the left side, specific phenolic plate for the right side. This has a direction of rotation marked in it, which in this instance is clockwise and matches the clockwise um, markings that are on the, um, on the finger. If you'll notice, there's a little advanced position box here that is scribed on the, um, on the plate. And what that is, is this is the position that the finger should be installed when the engine is set at 30 degrees before top dead center on the compression stroke. And that's where we've got it set up right now. And what I'd like to show you is I'm going to go through one revolution of the crankshaft and show you what happens. Okay, there we're moving. Okay, that is one revolution of the crankshaft. So you'll see that we're 180 degrees out. And if we do another revolution of the crankshaft, we're back up again at 30 degrees before top dead center. So anytime you have the magneto out of here, it's a good idea to pull your distributor caps off and make sure that the, uh, the electrode is pointing in the advanced position box because it needs to be in that location for the magneto to go in. So at top dead center, um, uh, on well, no, at 30 degrees before top dead center, on the compression stroke, then this is the advance box for the distributor. On the left side, we have a, a comparable one. Turning the page to page 305, we have under 9 check cylinders. Check cylinder hold down nuts for tightness using the box socket wrench furnished for this purpose. Now this is, this is the one I was talking about, cylinder base nuts. Uh, cylinder base nuts are, it's very important that you inspect those things. Uh, there are only eight cylinder hold down nuts on the Lycoming engine. Uh, Jacobs have many more than that. Continental have many more than that. The Lycoming only has eight. So when you, when you lose torque on one of them, uh, then you've got seven that are holding the load that were supposed to be held by eight. Now I'm not talking about the nuts backing off. These things are pal nutted they're not going to turn. But what happens is, after several heating and cooling cycles, you've got a, a steel cylinder base and you've got an aluminum case and they're heating and cooling at different rates. Different coefficients of expansion, so they're, they're moving on each other. And even though the nut itself does not turn, <clears throat> after many cooling and heating cycles, the nuts are no longer holding the same torque that they were. And so these things have to be retorqued periodically. If you've got a 300 horse engine um, that has that uh, late style ignition ring that we looked at and, and baffles, it's a real problem. It, um, it's a, a big chore because you have to remove the baffles and then you have to uh, unbolt that ring and pull the ring forward so you can get to the cylinder bases to, um, to look at those and, and retorque. And again, when you retorque them, you retorque them in an X pattern, uh, bringing them up to 300 inch pounds. Uh, I'll show you something in a little bit that will help you with this, with the, uh, the baffle issue, but um, uh, with the ignition harness, if that's the type harness that you're choosing to run, there's not much you can do. It's gonna be a problem pulling that thing forward. 
Number 10 under the 50 hour inspection is check propeller cones and shaft. At the end of each 100 hour period of operation, the propeller and propeller attaching parts should be carefully inspected. Instructions covering the removal inspection and installation of controllable propellers are contained in the manufacturer's instruction book. Okay, this is, uh, this is something that, um, that very, very few people are looking at. If you're running a 300 horse and you have a 2B20 constant speed propeller on there, it's really important that the preload on the blade bearings is set properly and then is maintained. If you can, can go up to your propeller blades, grab them and twist them and feel any movement at all, there's not enough preload on your blades. And what those blades do when they get loose is they begin to flutter. That gets transferred into the crankshaft and will ultimately break the crankshaft. So we've seen several instances of, uh, of broken crankshafts due to uh, the propeller being uh, loose not on the crankshaft, but actually in the blades. If it's loose on the crankshaft, it'll do it as well. But, uh, but if, it's, if the blades are loose in the hub, uh, that will also do it.